Welcome to uh, ProMet 2019. My name is John Santagate. I am a research director at IDC. IDC is a global research and advisory firm. And my role at IDC is to study and advise organizations on the market for commercial service robotics. And so when I'm talking about commercial service robotics, I'm referring to the application of the new generation of robots that are smart, mobile, collaborative, uh, and being deployed increasingly outside of industrial manufacturing environments. But what we're seeing uh, over the course of the last few years is this evolution of technology. At IDC, we started, we started researching what we call the third platform of technologies. That's uh, cloud, big data analytics, social business, and mobility uh, many years ago. And what we're seeing today is that the evolution and proliferation of these technologies has resulted in advancements in related technology areas. And now we're looking at those technology areas called innovation accelerators. Those are things like 3D printing, IoT, robotics, next-gen security, AR, VR, et cetera. And we're seeing how the growth in cloud, the growth in analytics, the growth in mobility is driving new capabilities into these related technology areas. As I said, I specifically focus on robotics, so I'm going to drive, uh, drive the remainder of the presentation here to be specifically about the robotics arena. Now, one thing that really jumps out at me is several years ago, this little-known innovator, uh, Bill Gates, said that robots could have just as profound an impact on the way we work, communicate, and entertain ourselves as the PC has had over the last 30 years. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. How impactful has the PC been to global society over the past 30 years? We're all, you're on one right now. We all carry a PC around in our pockets and our backpacks and we use them for everything we do from educating ourselves and entertaining ourselves and working. And so for such an innovator, the, essentially the godfather of the PC to believe that robots could have a similar impact on society, I think is very telling. Uh, and to me, help drive my decision to, to on this area of research. So what I also like to do is sort of level set. We're at an automation event here today in Promat and Automate, and so there's, there's a fundamental difference, I believe, between automation and robotics. I like to start with defining or drawing the lines between what those are. And so the current state of robotics are technologies that are multitask capable. You, they can quickly be deployed and reprogrammed to do different things. They enable task flexibility. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing the emergence of mobile robots, uh, and they're intelligent. They're, they're capable to a degree of thinking on their own, and they're being deployed in new areas such as pick and pack, pallet movement, assembly, even security. Uh, and one thing I like to, I, I sort of came to the realization of as I've been here over the last couple of days, is if you think back two years ago to Promat 2017, Locus was here and there was one or two other mobile robotic vendors at this particular event. Very small presence, it was a very emerging space. If you go back two iterations ago, none of them were here with maybe one or two minor exceptions. And over the course of the last four years, we have seen this technology grow to the point where mobile robotic vendors have a prominent position. In fact, everywhere you look, there's an autonomous mobile robotics vendor at this event. And I've seen that at other events as well. I was at Logimat in Germany, uh, four weeks ago, and there was a dozen or more autonomous mobile robotics vendors that I hadn't even been familiar with, and to me that's humbling, right, because it's a market that's growing so fast that I, who focuses explicitly on this area, am aware of what's going on and the growth of these guys as they're trying to come to market. Now, that also introduces some challenges. I do believe that this market is one that is characterizes low barriers to entry from a product perspective, but very high barriers to success. Vendors can create an autonomous mobile robot with components that are widely available in the market, but if they go to market with a strategy that isn't well defined and haven't thought through the, the data element, how do you integrate and capture and maximize the use of the information that these technologies are creating about your operation, again, that's another challenging factor. And so as this market grows and, and balloons in terms of uh, availability of vendors, it becomes very important to really think long and hard and do due diligence to understand the capabilities of the different uh, market participants. Now back to the difference between robotics and automation. You know, when I think about automation, that's really designed to carry out a specific task, to optimize productivity, throughput, and so forth. And when you're designing systems, they both have their role, both of these technologies have their role in modern uh, warehousing and fulfillment uh, environments. 
So, but what you see and what I've tried to depict here with these pictures here is you've got a sort of unfettered access with a robots like the Locust Robotics, and then you've got fixed infrastructure that characterizes traditional types of automation. And now we are seeing the introduction and alignment between robotics and automation, but I look at, the, I look at that in terms of um, scotch and whiskey, right? Where all scotch is whiskey, but not all whiskey is scotch. Robots are automating tasks and processes, but not all automation requires the use of robots. Now, what, what we're seeing, and I, as I mentioned, I study the market, and we do a lot of market surveys, and what we're seeing in the market, there's a couple of key elements that I'd like to point out. Uh, the first is I'm seeing a lot of growth with those robotics vendors that are focused at the task level. They're identifying a particular business problem in a particular industry and attacking that particular problem with a high degree of success. Uh, that said, there's others that are taking a broader view. It just seems to be that there's a lot of uh, successes when an organization can narrow in, zero in its message on a particular category. We're seeing market expansion with many new entrants. As I mentioned earlier, there's, there's dozens of autonomous mobile robotics vendors. They all have a different set of capabilities, competencies, and do things a little bit differently. And they all have different strategies and quite frankly are all very good at what they do. It's just a matter of targeting, finding the tasks that they succeed the best at. And what's really driving, uh, I think, a big chunk of this market is the availability of capital, and that's helping to drive new entrants. In, 20, in 2014, there was $346 million of venture capital that went into the robotics industry. And that's robotics vendors, that's AI, that's drones, that's the ecosystem of participation. In 2015, that number jumped to a billion dollars. That's a big jump. 20, 2015, 2016, that went to $2 billion. In 2017, there was over $15 billion that was invested into the market of robotics. And last year, there was over $12 billion. So we've seen it go from $346 million in 2014 to over $12 billion last year being invested into this industry. So there's a lot of opportunity for innovators to come up with a great idea and get capital to create a product to take to market. And so that's helping to drive the ecosystem and opportunity. And I think that's you know quite relevant or quite, quite um, expressive at this particular event. You're seeing that in living color. So when I think about um, warehousing and the opportunity to leverage these technologies, it, you know, it, it's first important to understand what the, you know, how the different environments uh, appear, right? Or what the, the options are. And so you know, you've got manual, traditional manual operations. And again, you go back two iterations of Promat, there wasn't so much availability of autonomous mobile robots, and so many operations were leveraging manual, manually executed paper-driven processes, right? Those are processes that are driven by manual labor. The cost is a function of the cost of labor uh, in those environments. They're highly flexible, right? If you need to, to a degree, I should say, uh, but if you need to increase capacity, you add people to the problem. Now, that also compounds the issue of cost because when you hit a certain point, people become unavailable, as we've seen in the current market structure. It's not as easy to add labor to these types of environments, and therefore the cost structure of the labor that you're able to add increases because you're increasing the rates in order to get the people to fulfill the problem. Uh, but it's highly scalable. Again, it's about adding people, and there's no, there's no modifications required. It's easy to change the environment. You change your racking structure, but that's really it. You bring people in and you can execute to the process. Uh, then there's that fixed, based, uh, fixed asset based automation, which is very rigid, right? Systems like ASRS and con conveyance, as I mentioned, very effective in, in well-designed productivity environments that require high degree of throughput. Uh, but it comes at a very high cost. Uh, not very flexible. If you want to add to it, it's, it's very challenging to do so. In many cases, you're looking at doing a new build and replacing a structure. When you're building, you know, conveyance-enabled automation, you might build it out for four years. And then at the end of that four years, your capacity, you've reached your capacity requirements. You need to go to a new facility. You can't just add or easily add the capability to put more material through that facility. Um, in terms of scalability, again, the, the capacity is built into your design. And then it, the infrastructure, it's fixed. It's a high investment in fixed, rigid infrastructure, uh, which, again, is right in certain environments. Uh, but today we're seeing new opportunities, opportunities to leverage more flexible technology that can achieve the same amounts of throughput. So I've started to look at this market in two, really two categories. 
The first is your constrained mobile asset-based automation. Think of that as rack the person, right? The robots that are operating autonomously in a part of the facility where people are not going to be present. You're not going to have people walking around on the floor in a facility where the racks are being shuttled to and from their position to a picking location. They're collaborative in a sense that the robots bring the product to the people, but the people aren't necessarily operating in those environments. And so you've got a medium bit of cost. There, there's still a bit of cost involved. You're going to have a large number of those robots, enough to, f to meet the capacity requirements of the space that you're, uh, you're operating within. Medium bit of flexibility, you can add new capacity, but you have to add additional uh, you know, picking locations. Perhaps you have to place uh, additional fiducials on the floor and extend the operating capacity of the robots. Um, rather, rather smaller in terms of scalability. You're not gonna be able to bring it up and down as rapidly. You're building your capacity limits into the initial design. You can flexibly enhance that capacity, but then it's not easy to scale up and down. And then uh, you do have semi-fixed infrastructure that you're going to apply in those environments. Again, very good in high throughput, consistent SKUs, an organization that knows what they need to move, has a good idea of it, can make very good uh, productivity and efficiency improvements using this type of a model. And then uh, the, the second option for robot-enabled um, automation is the flexible mobile, mobile robot-enabled automation, which is that very fast-growing category that we're seeing tremendous innovation occur. Companies like Locus that are deploying robots that are collaborative in nature, they're working with your people. Relative, they're lower in cost, higher, higher possibly in term, compared to manual labor, but they're very low in cost, and they're, in fact, being offered in many cases as a service you know, a per pick type of model or per use type of model. Very highly flexible, especially if you think about, you know, the, the Black Friday selling season and you run up to a scenario where you've got a, a labor constraint and you can't full bring in the people to meet the need of your fulfillment requirements, you can quickly deploy this sort of technology that has a shared brain. So you put it on and you don't have to train that robot. That robot's operational as soon as you drop it into a floor, assuming that the system's already in place. Again, I'm talking about the ability to flex the existing system. Uh, highly scalable, you need more scale, you add more robots. Uh, and in this sort of an environment, there's little to no infrastructure to deploy. Okay, so as I said, I think each strategy has a role in the modern environment. I think in many facilities, you'll find a combination of the different strategies deployed in the same facility. You'll find an a area where you use your constrained mobile asset-based automation for your high throughput, consistent SKUs you'll find a part of your warehouse where you're fulfilling your e-commerce that's got highly seasonal items, little, very low consistency. You're adding and changing your customers that are in that facility. And the, the flexible mobile asset-based automation makes sense. In other facilities, you're gonna be optimizing uh, throughput. So you're gonna go with the, um, you know, the more traditional ASRS and sortation type of, or and conveyance type of automation. So what's really driving this today? As we see it, you know, there's, there's several key elements, uh, but a few of the major ones is, first and foremost, the labor issue. Okay, having gone to ProMap for many years now, you know, labor has been a consistent uh, story across CSCMP and ProMap and all the supply chain environments. It's, we don't have, we're having trouble bringing the people in to allow us to scale when we need it. It's not necessarily about the foundation of labor, right? You're, you're loyal and consistent employees, but when you need to scale for times of peak seasonal demand, it's becoming more and more challenging, especially in certain areas where you might have an Amazon fulfillment center across the street from a Walmart, diagonally across the street from Target. Now those three fulfillment centers are fighting for the same labor pool. And so you're out there throwing up you know, $15 an hour, $20 an hour, $25 an hour to enable that you can meet your required service levels to your customers. Okay, so increasing costs, seasonal needs, and a shortage of labor. And I, and I have misconnected there as a, a point as well. This technology is digitally connected to your operation. You have a digital footprint to everything that, these, that this type of technology can do about your fulfillment operation. Humans, you don't necessarily have that. You might have uh, hand scanners, geotagging enabled, but there's data about your operation that can be collected through the use of autonomous mobile robots that you just simply can't do with manual enabled operations. Uh, the need for speed. Customers today are increasingly expecting rapid delivery times. The Amazon effect is, is no secret in the industry. Your customers want your products next day because if they can't get it from you next day, they'll get it from somebody else next day. Okay, and if you have trouble meeting those fulfillment requirements, you, you run a big amount of risk in your organization. And so 
again, looking to robots to increase the flexibility to allow you to fulfill to your customer needs faster. Uh, the cost of labor is increasing, and the, and the cost of robots has decreased. Right? We've seen in the availability of components emerge to the fact that you know maybe four or five years ago the vision systems in these robots cost fifteen thousand dollars and today it's fifteen hundred and they're more capable they're doing better things so we're seeing the the cost come down and that again is a function of the growth of the market but also tangential markets the market for autonomous cars is creating a lot of technology that is related to the sorts of autonomous mobility that robots are doing. And that market has a lot of money being invested in it to create components that are going to allow automakers to come to market with affordable options. And that's translating to reduction in cost relative to robotics components. And then the robot as a service model. I mentioned that before. So organizations that are allowing you to deploy robots with little to no upfront cost and scale as needed per pick or per order or per device. Okay, and then you know the the idea of modernization is really driving change across the broad broad ecosystem of industries. Companies need to do better at leveraging modern technology to enable their business operations. So, I wanted to go back uh, after talking about the drivers and look at you know on one screen some of the the comparative differences against the different types of warehouse operations. Right, you see uh, they each have a role in your organizations but it's about finding balance. What is important to you when you're making your purchasing decisions? If you're looking to optimize flexibility, speed, keep costs manageable, and have a high degree of human and machine collaboration, you're gonna look at flexible mobile robot-based automation. If you've got high budgets, maybe you're doing a net new greenfield facility, and you've got an understanding of what your capacity and throughput requirements are gonna be for the next five years, you, you very well may be looking at fixed asset-based automation with sortation and conveyance. Uh, but the, the, the point is with this particular uh, visual is that each of these elements has a different degree of value based on the, the categories of cost, flexibility, scalability, speed, ease of implementation, efficiency, and human machine collaboration. So I also like to think, uh, and I alluded to this a moment ago, that it's not just about the task. And I know I mentioned that when I was talking about the, the trends that are driving the evolution of this market, that it's task oriented. What is the problem that you're solving for your customers if you're making robots? But if all you're solving is autonomous mobility, the ability to go from point A to point B autonomously, you're adding very little value to the customer you, because you're missing out on the opportunity to capture the information and optimize the data element of that particular movement. And so I do believe that when you start to bring together the data element with the physical element, you can create a more comprehensive understanding of what's going, in, going on in your organization. And when I think about digital transformation and robotics, I think there is a very direct link between the use of autonomous mobile robots and the digital transformation of e-commerce order fulfillment, retail fulfillment, and warehousing. So, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, a recent survey that uh, we conducted at IDC. Uh, we, we asked eight different industries, none of which was an industrial manufacturing industry, about their current and intended use of robots. Okay, the industries included retail, hospitality, healthcare, oil and gas, local government, federal government, whole, warehousing and logistics, and uh, wholesale distribution. Okay? And we had an end of, it's not up here, an end of 600. 600 organizations in industries that are not traditional users of robotics, only 8% of them said we have no plan for robots. But what, what's, what's very interesting to me, and I'm very much looking forward to running this survey again to see how this has transitioned, you've only got about 16% of the companies that are using the robots at all today, have it in production. But you've got a high degree of pilots and a high degree of we plan to deploy within one year. So. What, what do I anticipate? I anticipate to see a slight shift to the left in terms of this graphic. I think events like this showcase that that's what we can expect because there's a high degree of organizations here. I think this, this event seems to be even more attended than the event from two years ago. And obviously there's a high degree of robotic vendors that are here showcasing their technologies. And I believe at this point it's beyond the pilot. We're actually beyond deployment and getting to scale and value delivery in terms of the messaging that we're hearing from the vendors and the users of this technology. Uh, so why are companies looking to deploy robots? So the top three here, I think, are, are 
expected, right? Improve efficiency and productivity, improve product and service quality, and increase operational capacity. These were the top three responses from the end of 550 that I said 600 before, that 50 or that 50 that said, no, we're never going to use them. Okay, well, I guess I don't care what you think about what other reasons we're going to deploy robots because you don't have any. Um, now, what's interesting, you see reduced overall operating costs comes in as the fourth highest, and then reducing labor costs is relatively low on the top 10 scale. What's more interesting to me is the benefits that have actually been achieved. And so you see increasing operational capacity was the number one of benefit that was identified by those organizations that have deployed commercial service robots outside of industrial manufacturing environments, okay? But you see that improved business flexibility jumped up six spots to be the number three cat reason or benefit, I should say, uh, that had been achieved through the use of robots. And even more impressive, I think, and, more, and I think it relates to flexibility, is the idea of scalability. No, the robots were enabling the flexible operation. So the ability to adapt and change. Something new they could do. Precisely, precisely. And then scalability wasn't even in the top 10 reasons to deploy this technology, but bumped up six spots or five spots to be in the top 10 benefits delivered. So that's great. So what were, compa what were companies looking to improve? What did they improve? So that's all good information. But what's more important is how great was that improvement? OK, and so I wanted to know. You've made these improvements, but how impactful was it for your business? And across all the metrics, 70% of the time, users of this technology achieve double-digit improvements. That's across capacity. That's across productivity, efficiency, operational speed, et cetera. You can look here. These are all, this part of the survey is only relegated to those companies that have deployed the technology. But when you think about all of the productivity gains that organizations have made since the introduction of Lean and Six Sigma methodologies, we've pulled a lot of the waste out of these manufacturers and uh, logistics operations have pulled a lot of the waste out of their processes. Now there's a new tool in the toolbox, as you alluded to, that's allowing them to once again get double digit improvements, which many organizations are happy with 6% improvement in productivity if you can get that. Now the question is how long does it take to get there, right? So keep it. Keep in mind, this is, a, this is a slide that's relevant across industries, okay? So it's no one industry that we surveyed that identified these. And so that also means that this isn't just on autonomous mobile robots. This is about collaborative robots, surgical robots, et cetera. But we found that 65% of the projects had a payback period in under two years. Now, what do I believe? This is an assumption. I, I think it's been shown time and again. Autonomous mobile robotic technology is achieving those payback periods even faster, especially when you think about those that have deployed robot as a service. If you're deploying it as a service and you're not putting any cash outlay in the instance that you don't have to or minimal cash outlay, you're going to accelerate that payback time. Now, the next question is how big was the ROI? And again, double digit ROI 80% of the time. Companies are getting a double digit ROI and improving their key performance metrics by double digits and achieve, achieving a payback period in under two years when deploying commercial service robotics in their, in, in their um, operations. So with all that said, some points of essential guidance from IDC. The first point is that there is a wide market for flexible automation. Again, this show is a perfect example of the various options for organizations to consider. When you're, if you're looking at this type of technology, you've got a wide range. Make sure you do due diligence because there is going to be a solution that's best fit for your particular needs. Think about robots in the context of modernization and digital transformation. These are digitally connected assets that are performing a task for your business and in the context of performing that task are creating mountains of valuable data that you can mine that wasn't available to an organization before. Leverage insight from your peers, right? This is a great environment to network and discuss with your, your peers, your competitors, and your colleagues on how they're using this technology. Learn from their best practices. This is a new technology area. Again, two iterations of this show four years ago, this, we weren't having this conversation. And so it's evolving very quickly. Learn from the pitfalls of those that have done this before. And don't wait. It's too late to start thinking about this stuff. Organizations need to think about this now because if you wait, by the time you get around to it, the technology is going to have changed. This technology is changing so fast. It's better to get engaged today, start plotting your path forward, and become engaged 
with the robotic vendor ecosystem so that you're ready as they evolve and you know what's coming down the pipe. So with that, thank you for hanging out with me for 45 minutes. Uh, happy to take a couple questions if we got them.